Joe Hillman and John Laskowski of Vince Kind to join us. Two players that have played on great, great Indiana teams with Coach Knight in different eras, and I love that. And John is probably, uh, I, I'm going to give him the title as uh, almost from a player's perspective, you are the IU basketball official historian. Um, he knows more about everything, the people, the names, uh, was there in – when did you arrive? So you were in 75, so 71? Oh, it'd be the fall of 71. I went to Indiana as a freshman. So that's over 50 years ago. And I've seen so many games and so many players and announced so many games. It's just been a real pleasure to get to meet all the guys, Joe Hillman, of course, included, to watch those teams. Some struggle early and then finish great. That's the, that's the sign of Indiana basketball. We weren't very John, good John, were you the first recruiting class yes. for Coach Knight? Yes. Yep. Yep. First class. Nobody knew who he was. Bob Knight, he's from Army. I asked my high school coach. He said, well, he, Bob Donowell, great guy, and uh, became a, a coach at Indiana my junior and senior year. But he, I said, Coach, who is this guy? He said, well, he's from Army, okay? And they play a lot of defense, you know, and that's how they win their games. He said, but but we play defense here at, at St. Joe High School, so you'll be fine. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me everything. <laughs> then, hey, he didn't know everything. Then it was too late. I'm there, baby. Yeah, what are, the, what are some of the things he left out? Uh, <laughs> well, my, I went to a Catholic high school, and so the language was very good at a, at, at a Catholic high school. <laughs> <laughs> in Indiana, there was nobody watching practice very often, as Joe knows. And and if it was a bad day, oh boy, it, it got bad. Uh, I'm sure you never experienced that, Joe. Language uh, that never the language never really bothered me. It was the tone. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know what was great about Coach Coach Kirsten swore when he was happy, when he was mad, when he was glad, when he was, you know, sad. I mean, that was just his, that was just his way. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, we, we had some stuff going last night with, uh, with a couple of the guys um, from the 87 team. We had, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us on a text thread and somebody played something. And I said, gosh, wouldn't you just love to be right in front of that, hearing that again. And, um you sit back now and you laugh about everything. And, and and John knows this. Indiana with Bob Knight wasn't for everybody. But the guys that were there and the guys that stuck around, um, it was for them. And there, there, there's such a great bond and a, and a brotherhood from it. And, you know, what if you left? That was okay. That, 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 but that was not on coach. That, that was your choice. And that was on you. The guys that's, that, that stayed and played and, Relished under it. it. It was a great, great experience. And I tell people all the time, if I have 17 again and had to do it all over, I'd go to Indiana without a doubt. And so I got nothing but great things to say about my five years at Indiana because it was um, it was a great experience. Here's one of my favorite clips that I that – I, one of the only clips that I say, but – That's one of my just I just love that clip, but I whenever Brian Evans is on, I have to show that or play that. But um that's typical any coach right there. But what was it that John early on uh, that you knew that there's something different here because he made it an instant impact. They gets to a final four. You you get to go to a final four, um, I believe in what your sophomore year or right. junior coach's year? Second year there, coach's second year. We go to the final four, and uh, another uh, recruit with me was Dr. Steve Offeld. He's done a lot of work on the guys over the years, and uh, Offeld had heard that at Army, uh, the players in preseason conditioning wore Army boots and would run upstairs. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if you did it, Joe, but we ran up Memorial Stadium uh, to get into training before I think we knew what shin splints were. <laughs> and Offeld in one of the first meetings asked Coach Knight, Coach, are we going to wear Army boots to climb up those stairs of Memorial Stadium? And, and he's kind of joking, but Coach, he doesn't like to be overshadowed. So he barked right back and said, Offeld, you'll wear whatever I want you to wear. <laughs> and that was the end of that. So you never questioned. You, you got an idea. Coach, I got this idea. How about this? No, 
it was coach's idea on how everything went and that that's how it was and and once you adjusted to that uh, life was good and he was probably like 26 years old at that time right yeah he got the job at 30 he was 30 oh, years okay. old okay so okay. still still very young still very young though yeah i think he got the army job at 25 or 26 army job yeah. at 24 right and then the iu job at 30 yep. yeah no, we never had to run up those stairs because we started going over to the soccer stadium and doing all that stuff for preseason. Okay. Um, okay. I told them, you know, with Coach Knight, once season started, you never ran. Everybody finds that just me. We, we never ran for conditioning because um, we practiced that hard. Um, right. No, we ran a couple of times for punishment, but we just never – there was never lines, you know, like suicides or whatever. We, we, that, we never did that. Right. Um, but – Trust me, practice was hard enough that you didn't need to do that for conditioning. That's for sure. Practice was harder than the games. Oh, yeah. um, you know, sure. three three fifteen to to almost six o'clock, and uh, so game game day was a day off. I mean, you got your uniform on, you got people in the stands, uh, you get timeouts. Uh, it was great. You have people grabbing and fouling you, trying to get their shirt changed from uh, right. white to red. Right, right. So, you yeah, know, game day yeah, practices were way harder than games for sure. And, and John, so with the uh, early on, you guys see early success, and now you're at a Final Four. You're playing UCLA. Uh, I can't remember who else was there that 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 year. Uh, uh, Kentucky and Louisville were they both there? No, no, no. That was uh, let's see, Providence uh, with Ernie No D Gregorio, and uh, uh, let's see who else was there. I mean, we played UCLA, and then uh, Memphis State was there. Oh, yeah, yeah, Memphis State. Yeah, uh, Memphis, and then you know, in seventy, he, he started the he started the season and said, "Guys, our goal is to win the Big Ten championship." You know, it wasn't to go to the Final Four; it was win the Big Ten championship. Almost every year, that's no, what the goal year. was. Yeah, oh, yeah, it never changed. And then, so we said, okay, that's what we're going to do. And, uh, and all three years I played, uh, Joe got to play five years. I got to play three years. I'll tell you, I wish I would have been his age, you know, more, more years. Oh, the freshmen weren't eligible when you were, okay. Got that's right. So, so we won three big 10 championships, uh, uh, in a row. And then of course the 76 team won again. So that's four big 10 championships in a row. Four of his first five years, he won the big 10. Wow. That's amazing. And on that 75 team that you were a part of that, uh, most likely would have been undefeated if uh, not for the injury uh, to Scott May. That had to be, of course, uh, heartbreaking for you because that was your last season there. But to go through the Big Ten undefeated, to be on, on a team like that, that had to be, be and still cherishes to be very, very special. Uh, absolutely. You know, as you look back into history, uh, the 75, 76 teams, that's 36 wins in a row. And then the next year they won their first game. So 37 wins in a row of the big 10, that's still a record. The second place is 20 by the 1960 Ohio state team that Bob Knight played on. <laughs> so, so 37 is, is nobody's going to come close to that. Yeah, I think that, uh, that that's going to be unbelievable. And then Joe, when you were uh, playing for him, he had gone through a lot of success, uh, as we talked just talked about with John, and and now he's staring at a a, a third national championship. What was it like uh, when I talked to people like Todd Leary? He would he says that a lot of Knight's antics during the NCAA were purposeful. That he thought that he was drawing the attention away from the team with purpose to try to relieve stress uh, off of them. But you guys were, were almost machine-like because you had certain players who played their roles, certain good players, yourself, Alfred. Um, but then there were guys that came off the bench that also had just a role, but they were probably – wouldn't have been on a lot of other college teams, but they could play on this one Whoa. by playing their role. That's a misconception because anybody that went to Indiana could have played anywhere else because they were good. Uh, I was one of those bench guys coming off on the championship team, and trust me, every guy on that bench could have played in another D1 school because th that's how good they were. But um, I, I think the media really misconstrued what Coach Knight did, and, and, and he had a method to his madness or whatever you want to call it. But Knight did take a lot of the, the focus off of the players, and it, it just allowed us to play. We didn't have to go to do this media, this, this, that. It was all about Coach Knight when you showed up and Indiana was there. And, and 
again, we, we just had to focus on doing what we were supposed to do on the court. After we win it all, I remember the post-game conference uh, or the interview stuff with Billy Packer and Brent Musburger. Coach made it all about the players. I mean, he was like, you know what? Hey, I've done this. So I've talked to these kids. but And that's just the way he was. Um, and I appreciate it now that I'm now that I'm gone. What he used to do with the media is there were there was really nothing that we had to do with that. We we weren't involved in somebody getting misquoted. Now, what coach used to do is go and do his press conference after the game. Then we'd shower, and then they would come in, and everybody would talk. And that and that was that was fun. That was great. Um, but again, with with what coach would do to, to help the success of our team and the things that he set up, he, he just made it easier. Um, just with his, his knowledge is set up is breaking down film. I mean, it just, like John said, games were way easier than practice because we seem to know what the other team was supposed to do more than they did. Yeah. And your run, uh, not to cut you off, John, the LSU and the UNLV wins. Those were gigantic because of, First of all, the gigantic force of Shaq being on that LSU team. And UNLV looked like uh, almost unbeatable with the team that they had. And the way that you guys were able to win both of those games, kind of uh, almost amazing. Well, Shaq wasn't on that LSU team. He came like two oh. years later when Indiana beat him to go to the regionals. Um we should have lost the LSU game. We played awful. And um, but we executed down the stretch. I mean, that 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 was the one thing. We we rarely lost close games in Indiana because one, we trusted each other and coach knew who to put in and and it, we just executed and rarely do we make a lot of mistakes and we made free throws. Um the the brilliant coaching job that he did in the Vegas game was he came to us. On that Tuesday, we've beaten LSU on Sunday. Monday, we had a practice where coach for 15 minutes went just bonkers on us, yelling and screaming. I get, you know, if you don't have any interest in playing any harder than this, it was basically our day off. I mean, but he wanted us to get sweat going. It was brilliant. He hadn't watched any film. He walked in the next day on Tuesday and he said, All right, here's the deal. We're going to run up and down with Vegas. No more four pass thing. I want the first good shot taken. I don't care. If you get an open look, take it. We're not going to play against their D for 40 seconds. They're going to wear us down, and we're going to lose a 70-60 to 60 game, but we're going to run up and down, and nobody's going to expect it, but we'll get wide-open looks. Anything we want in the first 15 seconds of the shot clock. We're all like, whoa, 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 where's this coming from? And we had the three best practices we had all year on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then we had to practice early Friday – because we had to go down the shoot around for the mandatory shoot around at the Superdome. And we started off practice. He said, all right, red, bring it in white convert on misses. Alford hits a three on the very first uh, possession. He goes, all right, we're ready. Let's go win a national championship. See you on the bus. And it was just like, all right, here we go. I mean, he, he was so good at setting the tone to getting you ready to go. Now, Trust me, there was days where he knew we were probably going to win a game against somebody and he'd get after you to make it tough. But it was all for, here we go, progression. Next game, next game, next game. John, was there ever a big win in Indiana? A big win? A big win. Well, every win was expected. Yeah, okay? but every <laughs> loss was a horrible loss. <laughs> I'm going to prepare you guys and we're going to win this game. And if you screw this up, it's on you because the plan is going to work. You yeah. know? You know, one thing I want to say, Jim, uh, you know, you see all the guys and their favorite players, but some of the most important people of Indiana basketball are those reserves who had to play against those starters every day in practice. And Coach Knight, of course, would take the, the starting five, six, or seven, depending on, you know, who was going to play. And he would coach those guys during that practice and scrimmage. And the assistant coach's job was to manage that second team. They're playing against the first team, if you will. And they would be on those guys. Guy, you got, is that all the better defense you can play? Can you jump higher than that? Can you run faster than that? So they not only coached the first guys that were playing, they coached the reserves because they knew they had to have comp we had to have competition in practice or the teams we played would, would be much, so much better. So the great players that didn't get to play, as Joe had mentioned, 
were a huge help in every practice to get us ready to play in in competition. Yeah, I remember John. I remember one time. But this was my freshman year or something, and and these guys in the dorm were like, "How is so and so on the team? Hey, he can't play." I said, "You guys have no idea what you're talking about. These guys thought they could play. They're probably little high school guys that play a little bit." So I took uh, Cree Smith myself, and I I forgot who the other guy was, and we went over and we played these guys, and they couldn't get a shot. They had just no idea. And they got a different appreciation of how good you had to be just to get to Indiana. I mean, yeah, you're always going to have guys that don't play, and but those guys are good players. I mean, it just it always astonished me when people think, "Well, that guy never plays; he can't be any good." Well, yeah, I don't know That's about wrong. that. Wrong, wrong. I, uh, I I I did get a chance to check on Coach Knight's athletic ability as well, Jim. Uh, when I was in high school, he came to St. Joe High and and said, you know. Um, I just signed a contract to sign for your senior year. The team's going to the Rainbow Classic in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I thought, <laughs> man, I've never known St. Joe County. That Hawaii sounds like a pretty good deal. And so he laid that carrot out there in front of me, you know. And so I signed on for Indiana, not just for that reason, obviously. And so my senior year comes. This is four years later, okay? And we've been through a lot. And, you know, I've matured a lot. And, uh, and we played Notre Dame, as we always did in early December, Joe, and I yep. hurt my foot in the game. And I was out for a few games, and now it's time to go to Hawaii. And he comes over, and he looks at me, and he goes, hey, he said, uh, if you can't play, I mean, there's no reason for me to take you to Hawaii. I mean, I don't need you to sit on the bench. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, my gosh. this is I bet that is, foot got better real fast, this didn't is it? terrible. You know, I've been waiting and waiting. He goes, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, uh, I'll play you in a game of horse. And if you beat me in a game of horse, I'll take you to Hawaii. Oh, now, man. I'm 21 and he's 34, 35. I mean, he's not old. He's, you know, he can still play. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this game. <laughs> I kicked his butt and I went yeah. to Hawaii, baby. <laughs> and I got to play. So that was one of the, the other challenge. He, he ran sprints with us one day because we were screwing up and uh, pull the hamstring muscle, okay, running. And, and at the game, the next day, at a home game, he's limping around because he can't he can't get that hamstring to walk normally. And he never told anybody how he hurt his leg. <laughs> That's hilarious. That was probably the end of that. That, that probably yeah, that was the last one. That, that's the last one. You guys <laughs> never had to see that. Yeah, yeah. The closest thing I've heard about that is uh, back when uh, Pat Graham and, and that group we're, we're, we're in, in Bloomington that uh, I don't remember who challenged who that Pat may have challenged uh, Knight to a free throw shooting contest. And Pat Negram, of course, one of still one of the greatest free throw shooters of all time at Indiana, pure shooter. And he actually lost that game, some uh, that match him down. He goes, wait a minute, let's do it again. He said, Knight just walked off and said, sometimes you just get one opportunity in life. <laughs> that's a good one that sounds about right <clears throat> but he wasn't gonna let's put it this way you're gonna let pat get the uh, one up on him or or anybody uh, yeah, he had the upper leg and he was gone from that um funny. of course you know he was a polarizing figure but there was a lot of people or a lot of as good sides to him that he didn't let people see a lot of the time i, I wonder why that was well, he was a private guy. I mean, he, you know, he, he would always, if it was just you, he'd walk numerous times. He'd walk up to me and say, Hey, Joe, geez, you know, I put you in cause I think you're going to play. Well, I'll put you in cause I just go in and play. You'll be all right. I trust you. I mean, he one-on-one, -on -one, he was great. Um, and I mean, it, you know, if, if you needed something when you graduated, you just had to call him and ask. Now you better go in there with a game plan of what you needed him to do. Um, because if you walked up and, hey, coach, I need some help. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. Well, God dang it. Come back and see me when you know what you want to do, and I'll help you any way I can. Um, but – and he always said that to us. Hey, look, I'm not going to be your friend while you're here playing for me. I'm going to get after you. I'm going to push you. I'm going to make you the best player and best person you can be. But after you graduate, I'll be your best damn friend you got for life. Um, and he, he always – if I needed something or asked him to do something – he always said yes. Yeah, I uh, 
1975 team, eight players played in the NBA off that team. And, and boy, that's a, a very unusual for, wow. for that many. Of those eight guys, uh, I was with Chicago Bulls two years and was the first of those eight to be cut. Okay. I have that <laughs> distinction. Uh, so I get a call from Coach Knight. And he goes, come here, I need to talk to you. I go, what's up? He goes, all right. He said, I need to educate the people of Indiana about Indiana basketball. Okay. We're not the hurrying Hoosiers anymore. We're going to play defense. We got this motion offense we're going to run. And uh, I need you, I need somebody, a former player, to be on TV as my color commentator to explain what's going on. Okay. We're going to educate these folks on what Indiana basketball is. And I said, Coach, I understand the offense. I understand the defense. But I said, that TV, you know, I'm kind of a shy guy. I, I, I am not, I would not be good on TV. And he, he didn't bat an eye. He looked at me and said, no, I think you can do it. I said, well, what do you have to do to be on TV coach? He said, well, when the red light comes on, start talking. Hey, there you go. 33 years. I was on TV covering Indiana basketball because he said, you're the guy I want to do this. And in my protest didn't matter to him. It was going to happen. And it did. And I think, Thank God that he allowed me to do that. And Ted Kitchen and I were on the air for 10 years. I still hear comments for the 10 years. I was the play-by-play -play guy. Kitchen was the color guy. And, and I was the straight uh, uh, force. And he was the guy out in left field who would say anything. And it was a great <laughs> combination. And, boy, the people just loved us those 10 years with Kitchen on the air. Uh, and they still miss that. I mean, and the fact that you were able to do it, you did it so naturally, actually. And w when you were no longer there, people did miss that. And, but was it just him instilling that confidence that allowed you to, I mean, I know he forced you to do it almost, but, uh, but was it that not when it, that's top thing. I mean, when you're yeah, going on the air in any kind of a way, it's, it's, it's a little just daunting. I can only imagine what it was like back in that era, you know, TV wasn't a big thing yet. And to step into that role. It's the same concept as Joe knows of playing the game. Oh my gosh, we're playing Minnesota today. Oh my gosh, we're playing Michigan. We can't beat those guys. Go, wait a minute here, guys. Here's what, if you do this and you do this and you do that, we're going to beat these guys. And he has this vision of how things are going to play out in basketball. And the TV would be no different. Okay, here's my guy. He understands the game. He doesn't have any confidence he can do it. But I'm going to put him in there, and he's going to be fine. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and he helped along the way a little bit. But it's just amazing how he impacted all our lives. You know, we want to think that it's because we were great basketball players, we became good people. It was because he saw a vision in each one of us and said, here's where you need to go. And Joe's exactly right. You call him and you say, I need this. And he does it for you just like that. No questions asked. And, and I had a, and I had a big deal, Jim, where um, I don't know, it must have been 2001, 2002, maybe when he first got to Texas Tech. I get a call from a friend of mine and, and he says, Hey, you need to call this guy at logo athletic. <clears throat> they got a job opening. That's going to represent Reebok for the Colts, the Pacers finish line and foot locker. So I call the guy up. He says, Hey, you need to call the guy that's doing the interviewing. This is John Wangler. He played football up in Michigan. So he gives me his number. I call up John and, and John says, Oh, Joe, I wish you would have called me a couple of weeks ago. I said, well, John, I just heard about this. He goes, well, we've already done the first round of interviews and, um, yeah, let me let me go back to the Reebok guys and, and give them a call. So I call Coach, and I say, Coach, I need something. He goes, what do you need, Hillman? You only call me when you need something. I said, <laughs> oh, Coach, I really need this. I said, I need Coach Schembechler's number. He goes, what do you need his number for? I said, one of his ex-players is uh, doing the interviews for this job at Logo 7 Reebok, and I'd be great at it, Coach. It'd be a great job for me. And he said, well, give me his number. I'll call him. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. About an hour later, I get a call from this number up in Michigan, and it was John Wangler. He goes, oh, Hillman, you've done it now. I said, what? He goes, I just got off the phone with Coach Knight, and he told me if I gave you this job, he'd switch everything from Adidas to Reebok down at Texas Tech. I mean, that's a wow. big, big commitment. And so I went and met with the guys at Reebok, and the guys just – the guy, the CEO of Reebok is like – I can't believe this. This guy's going to switch everything from Adidas to Reebok. If we, what do you got on him? This guy must really <laughs> like you. I said, I'm just telling you, that's the way he is. And everybody misunderstood. And he goes, Joe, we already basically got the guy hired. 
we're a young company. He's kind of a lightning rod. We just can't take the risk on this. I'd love to do this, but da, da, da. and that's what it is. But that's what Coach and I would do for you. If I mean, I'll never forget that. And you know, that's why I'm so appreciative of all the stuff that he's ever done for me. Uh, that's shocking that they still did not do that. I cannot believe that. Uh, that was unbelievable. Well, Coach wasn't in the best of. Uh, in the best situation when he first went down to Texas Tech because he was just coming off the thing at IU. And yeah, I could see I, there would have been some rough publicity for him. The growth of IU basketball was a big part of it, John. Were those T, WTD, TTV4 broadcasts? Everybody and their brother watched. I, I remember being at, at my next door neighbor's best friend's house. We were in the basement all the time. They had the, the one TV. We, we had just gotten cable. We were down in southern Indiana and in, in, in little Georgetown, Georgetown outside of New Albany. And but those WTTV games on. I remember the uh, arcing uh, metal stanchions that they had for the goals, uh, for the actual goals in Assembly Hall. It is it, just this. And you, Ted Kitchell, Chuck Marlowe. And we had a, a basketball goal, a Nerf basketball goal set up because we were like 12. And every time out, we're over there just playing and playing Nerf basketball. But that those broadcasts were a huge part in building this big IU fan base that, that grew to be what it was. It, uh, it actually evolved to Indiana basketball when everybody had their own network, you know, Missouri would have theirs, Florida, Indiana. Indiana was the highest rated locally produced sports show in America on Channel 4, okay? And it evolved when Kitch and I did it to a half-hour live pregame show, a two-hour live telecast, and a half-hour live postgame show, three hours of live TV in a row. I mean, the news was the only thing live at the time as well, and, and, and Indiana basketball. And for three hours, I, I tell you, our producer, Bob Caldwell, and Channel 4 did a wonderful job of getting everybody ready, and here's what we're going to do. And we ran that thing, and Coach and the team provided the entertainment, and people just loved it. And they, they every game, they'd watch the game. It was, uh, it was a big moneymaker for Channel 4, obviously, but, boy, the fans of Indiana still appreciate what that was. <laughs> Yeah, Chris talked about the State Farm. I think it was Indiana Farm Bureau, actually. What it, uh, commercials? Indiana Farm Bureau. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's where. Uh, any, how did Martha the Mop Lady come to be? Does anybody you know, know the answer to that? I know that she was an opera singer. Um, I don't know where from, and I'm not sure how it all got started, but I went to the game on Sunday, the exhibition game, and they played her on the video board before the game. It still lives on, and it's just a great tradition in, in basketball around the country. Uh, absolutely, and uh, the, the just the tradition, uh, the candy stripe pants, uh, warm candy ups. Which I pants. hold on, Jimmy. Let me tell. I told some folks this the other day, and they couldn't believe it either. Doc Councilman, the yeah, IU swimming, swimming coach. Okay, he was trying to be very scientific about his swimmers at IU. And one of the things he did was to put uh, Speedo swimming suits on those guys that were candy striped. And the reason he oh, did wow. it was for practice. He had an underwater camera and he was watching hip movements on their stroke to see if their hips were doing the right thing to make the stroke as fast as it could be, that the legs pumping. And because of this vertical uh, design with two different colors, he was able to see uh, an improvement <clears throat> swimming. Well, Knight hears about this and because he and Doc became fast friends, even though the two different completed in sports, they became good friends. And Knight said, man, we ought to get those for our warm up pants. We're the only, we'd be the only people in the country with something like that. And that's how the candy stripes started. The first year they didn't have them. And the second year, my first year playing, they wore candy stripe pants. It was just great. I, yeah, now, I knew that it came them. from. Better never get rid of those, John. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. no. I knew that, that it had come from swimming. I did not know that. I, I thought it was just something they wore like a warm up or something like that. I had no idea it was a Speedo and not that it's something that I really want to see these days, but maybe the IU team 
should think of that. Uh, maybe they still do. I don't. Know, I haven't <coughs> seen the meat, is. but that's amazing. I did not know all of that story, which is an amazing thing. But it wow, you want to talk about Indiana has been so fortunate to have coaches that were beyond their time. Bob Knight, Doc Councilman, uh, Jerry Yeagley, uh, all that back then. That's that was an amazing group of talent right there. Right. You know, going back to Channel Four for a second. I mean, I had so I, I couldn't believe how many people I had texting me from out of the blue last night. I mean, high school friends, friends from I mean, long time ago, and everybody remembered. Oh, when Indiana came on, I got to stay up late and watch it on Channel Four. And you know, not only was it to watch Indiana basketball, it was to watch Bob Knight. It was to watch was you know how coach was going to react and what would what was he going to do on a night to night basis but coach knight made us guys like john and myself and and guys that that were in between us he made indiana fans appreciate what we did on the court and how hard we played and uh how we understood the, the type of game that we were playing and you know john being a part of that helped with all that educating the fans because our fans understood what coach wanted us to do and that that's why it was so fun going out and playing at bloomington and assembly hall because the fans appreciated all the stuff that 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 we were putting out there and it's just not the same anymore because every game is on all these different things and we don't get the the local knowledge that john and ted provided uh it it was just it was the thing to do people used to get together let's go watch indiana play you know, and that, and that's that. It's just not the same anymore, guys. I cannot thank you enough for uh, taking time, especially on such short notice. Make sure you are going uh, by the Culvers in Bloomington. Uh, is it still number one in in all of Indiana or the nation? Yeah. It is the best-selling Culvers in Indiana out of seventy-five. Come on, there's the logo. I'll tell you, you're the best, Jimmy Coyle. I'm heading to the Culvers in uh, Seymour today. And tomorrow I'll be at the Colors in Bloomington. Come on by and we'll talk about Coach Knight. Well, you got one in Jasper now as well. Yes, Sun Scott has the one in Jasper, so it's going very well. Great uh, great and franchise. Future one coming down in Madison uh, for our, our folks down in southern Indiana as well. Uh, Joe, of course. Uh, Joe, is your all's logo changed? <laughs> yeah, we changed. So we uh, we went from Trustwell Strategies to Wellington Well Strategies on the merger. Um, Open up a... a you know, a whole new back office, a lot more uh, stuff that we have support and the website and the the platforms and all the training stuff. So it's uh, it was a great merger with the idea of creating an ongoing succession plan for all of our clients, um, which will be, you know, because a lot of times people come to me and say, well, what, Joe, when you're done, what am I going to do? I'm still going to be alive and around. And, you know, we've built this succession plan now going forward. So all good at Wellington Well Strategies. Make sure you uh, reach out to Joe, and we'll get that information to have that up as well. Uh, if you are needing it, everybody's in need of some financial assistance. Guys, again, I can't thank you enough. I super appreciate you guys have always been so great and gracious with, with your time with us, and I really sincerely appreciate you both. Well, Jim, thanks, Jim. appreciate it. You know, hey, Jim, thanks for being an advocate for Bob Knight. Um, you know, I mean that. He, he, he was a different – he, he was a great guy, and we're going to miss him, and uh, thanks for being an advocate for him. Well, thank you guys for being such great friends of the show. We really appreciate you both. Have a great day.